thank you all for joining us today for Eating for Health and to Avoid Pandemics. My name is Kelsey Leach and I am a program director here at Animal Place. And um, today we have two very special uh, guest speakers, Dr. Don Forrester and Linda, Linda Middlesworth. Um, today they'll be answering common questions and that will take about 30 to 40 minutes of this webinar. It is an hour long webinar. It will end at 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And um, the last 20 to 30 minutes or so, we will be taking questions from viewers. You will see down at the bottom of your screen a Q&A icon with two bubbles above it. You can click on that and actually enter your questions there. Um, when we open up the floor to ask questions, I will be reading those on your behalf and we will do our best to get to all questions. So I would like to go ahead and introduce our speakers. Dr. Dawn Forrester, MD, is a family medicine physician with over 40 years of experience. In 2008, he retired from the Permanente Medical Group after 30 years. Since then, he has served as the medical director for Earth Saves Meals for Health Programs with the Sacramento Food Bank and the Berkeley Missionary Baptist Church. From 2011 to 2018, he saw patients in the McDougall programs in Santa Rosa. He is a board member of nutritionfacts.org and a representative and speaker for the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, also known as PCRM. He is a co-founder and emeritus chief medical officer of Switch Healthcare Incorporated, and, a, and he is certified in leading and managing statistical process improvement and is an expert in preventing and reversing chronic disease. Now our second guest, Linda Middlesworth, uh, with Food for Life Cancer Project as a nutrition and cooking instructor with PCRM. Linda has been vegan for 32 years, beating her cancer, heart disease, and obesity. Linda is actively putting on vegan events, for example, Get Healthy Sacramento, and events featuring leaders in health, animal advocacy, and environment. She is also the owner of V-Dog, a vegan dog food business that she and her late husband David launched 15 years ago so dogs could benefit from a healthy, environmentally friendly, and cruelty-free dog mm -hmm. food. She is the organizer for the Sacramento Vegan Society, now with 4,650 members. She is the co-organizer of Sacramento Animal Rights, Sacramento Animal Health, Health, Animal Health, and Climate Safe Movement. She works part-time for California Family Fitness as an aerobic instructor and teaches step, kickboxing, body sculpting, dance aerobics, and Pilates. She's also known as a vegan mentor and can be found at veganmentor.org. So, Linda. I've got a list of the questions up, Kelsey. Okay. I could, I could give an overview for the people on the webinar. Sure, we might have to jump onto that. Um, Just let me know what you want to do. It looks like Linda's trying to call in on her phone which I, it might yeah we might see her join via phone which would be wonderful um i'll go ahead and start with the questions dr forrester um so what does it mean to eat for your health well the, the, you know most people are living in a toxic food and a toxic information environment and eating for your health means eating whole plant foods with minimal processing you know with little salt, oil, or sugar. And that's basically, you know, people should move in that direction from wherever they are. Um, uh, of course, uh, avoiding animal products is probably the top of the list. Uh, avoiding dairy might even be on top of that if I had to counsel somebody on where to start. Um, after that, you can go to uh, avoiding uh, oils. Everybody seems to think olive oil is a health food, but it's uh, you know, a tablespoon of olive oil is basically 16 olives uh, compressed down. So it's a processed food, uh, a, table, a teaspoon of sugar, and sugar hasn't been shown to be particularly harmful up to about four or five teaspoons a day for the average sized person. But a teaspoon of sugar is anywhere from six to 20 feet of sugar cane. So they're, all, they're very processed. So 
by avoiding animal products and then um, minimizing those and uh, avoiding oils. And then finally, the packaged foods that where they've taken the fiber and the water and the nutrients out and baked them. Um, Jeff Novick calls that concentrated, refined, and processed. CRAP or crap, just cut the crap out of your environment. So if you don't buy foods with labels, you don't have to read labels. Fortunately, they haven't started labeling things in the produce aisle. So there's not a little sticker on a tomato that says tomato is the only ingredient. So that's sort of the short method, uh, me you know, message, I think, for people. I mean, you can be vegan, of course, and you can be a fat vegan or a sick vegan because there's a lot of vegan junk food out there. Uh, but it's all processed, so. Sure, and what, so I don't know if you can go into more detail of uh, what it looks like to eat for your health or an example well, of if it. If you're looking at your plate, you should be seeing uh, foods that are plants that are prepared. Uh, we tend to cook our food, uh, and the reason we cook our food is we get about 10% more calories in because by cooking it, it tends to sort of pre-digest the food. Uh, <clears throat> and that's why we cook food. Uh, and of course, there's an awful lot of science about what to eat. And if people want to get into the weeds, they can go to nutritionfacts.org. Dr. Greger's website, you know, is a wealth of information. Our volunteers two years ago went through 37,000 articles to narrow them down for Dr. Greger's videos. Uh, so there's an awful lot of science, but I like to keep it simple for people who are trying to navigate in a complex world and just how do I eat? You know, so once you get the concepts and you've got to learn to shop differently and change your menu items. And most people have preferred items they do on a regular basis. And you can just start with breakfast or lunch or dinner, or you can just take your recipes that you've liked in your family for years and just make them healthier by generally adding more vegetables to them and things like that. Sure. How does eating for one's health correlate with avoiding pandemics? Well, we've learned a lot about pandemics uh, since the 1918 uh, pandemic, which ravaged the world and killed about 2% of the population around the world. And that was uh, a basically an influenza pandemic. And in the 20th century, uh, we had various influenza pandemics. Uh, influenza comes around every year. Uh, it's in the human population and it mutates. So we get new strains every year. But periodically, there comes strains that are a little bit harder for us to deal with because we don't have immunity. And 1958, Hong Kong flu, and then 1967, the Asian flus were particularly bad ones. Uh, so we learned in the 20th century that influenza viruses cause pandemics. In the 21st century, we have now been, uh, those have continued like with the swine flu in 2009, which was actually a pork mediated influenza virus, uh, we have found that the coronavirus, which has been around humans for a long time, uh, it's about 30% of what people would consider the common cold. But three times this century in 2002 with SARS, 2012 with MERS, which is Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, and then more recently with COVID 200, 2019 or COVID-19, we have come across coronaviruses that have sort of morphed enough that they cause, we don't have immunity to them. So we're susceptible. And uh, we got lucky with 2002 oh. because people actually got sick before they were actually, uh, we got sick because we, they got sick before they were infectious. So if you screen people, with, uh, you just still don't have sound, Linda. I think um, you don't have sound. We the hear video, you, Linda. The video is on. Yes, so is the sound. We can hear That's you now. What does that mean? Oh, you mean the computer sound? Is that better? Yes, I can hear you. The phone, please. Okay, let can me just finish that thought. We can turn it over Sorry, to Linda. I don't know what happened. Yeah. yeah. That's okay, Linda, I'm glad. I can't hear you now, let's see. Uh, so in 2002, we got lucky because people were infectious before they were sick. So, I mean, sick before they were infectious. Mm -hmm. So if you took, found people with fevers and quarantined them, the virus died off very quickly. 
So there were only about 8,000 cases, although 800 people died. So it was a 10% mortality rate. It was a significant potential for pandemic, but we were able to snuff it out. In 2012, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome came about uh, in the Middle East. And with that one, it's not very infectious. So it's very hard to catch. And we got lucky with that one. We weren't so lucky with this one in 2019 because it, people are infectious before they're sick. And there are a lot of people that are mildly infected, so they don't know they're infected. And then there are a lot of people who seem to be at a higher risk uh, with heart disease and hypertension and uh, diabetes and obesity. And those comorbidities can all be avoided individually by the way you eat. May I join you? Are you ready? <laughs> we would love for you to join us, Linda. Okay, I'm not sure what you covered already. Can you give me a little synopsis of what you talked about? We sure can. We went through our first two questions um, and okay. we're on to our third. Well, I have a question about the second question, or well, no, not the second question. Um, okay, the third question is, can people get all the nutrients they need on a plant-based diet? Some people say, oh, I need a little chicken here and there. I want to make sure I get enough protein. Some people say like Time Magazine came out with the fact that we should all eat butter and they had a big piece of butter on the front of the magazine. So it's very confusing for people to know what's right and what's what they should be doing. So can you tell us how that happens and what should what nutrients do we need to survive at all? I mean, do we need some of these little parts of animal products? We need dairy for calcium and eggs for protein. So if you're talking about general nutrients, you know, you've got your major your protein, your fats, and your carbohydrates. We run on carbohydrates, which are our main fuel. And if you eat adequate calories, you'll get enough carbohydrates. And you can certainly do that on a plant, plant diet, whole plant diet. Uh, the protein, meeting your protein if you have adequate calorie intake is not a problem. Even the IRA prisoners who died after about, on average, 80 days on pure water, when they were autopsied, they found that they had plenty of protein on their body. Uh, the fats, there are only two fats that we really need, and uh, they're, they're plentiful in animal pro in plant products as well. Um, and they're actually not very prevalent in animal products. And the type of uh, essential fat we need, the omega-6s, is more in animals than in plants. And actually, we were designed for an era of scarcity where we were, you know, basically our metabolism is designed to modify and digest plant fiber. Uh, so we're better off eating whole plants than we are animal products. And we can meet all our nutritional need with the possible exception of B12, uh, which is produced by bacteria and uh, uh, might need to be supplemented. There's other minor nutrients like iodine and uh, uh, vitamin D, which isn't really a vitamin. It's sort of you get it from sunshine. Uh, iodine is not a problem on the coasts where foods are grown because it's in the food. Uh, in the middle of the country in Colorado, there was a lot of problems with it in the 1920s. And that's when the government passed the policy to iodize salt. So if people use regular salt, they're going to get plenty of iodine. Uh, the uh, specialty salts, the sea salts and the Himalayan sea salts and things like that don't necessarily have iodine in them. So, uh, so those are the only nutrients. Are you saying we should have salt then with iodine or not? Well, I don't think we need to worry about it on the West Coast because our foods have it. And people are going to get exposed to that sort of salt in their diet anyway. So, you know, they're, it's not going to be a problem. Couldn't they just eat dulce instead and other seaweeds? Well, they could. Get their but, iodine? Yeah, they could. They could get their iodine from that. But there are also seaweeds. And I would refer people to uh, nutritionfacts.org to check the seaweeds out because there are some weeds, seaweeds that are toxic mm. uh, and you don't want to eat. So there are, uh, and it's a matter of personal taste too. Some people just don't like seaweed. Yeah. Um, so we should, I like the idea of checking nutritional facts for things you don't know about because he does all the research for us. So we don't have to look it up and try to figure it out ourselves. It's all done for us. That's Dr. Michael Greger, nutritionfacts.org. Um, 
What is the issue of eating dairy, especially? I'd like to know what you think about dairy. Well, if a patient were to come to me and ask me for one thing to not do in their diet, I would say cut out dairy first. I mean, dairy is basically uh, designed for baby cows. Uh, for some reason, the pediatricians think that once children turn to the age of two that they should drink milk. Uh, type 1 diabetes has been linked to milk consumption in childhood, and we're seeing more and more of that in the adults as we get into type 1, type 2, and now type one and a half diabetes, which has been called latent autoimmune diabetes of adults. It's got a new name. We've gizzied it up a little bit. So uh, dairy is, has growth hormones in it. It has uh, IGF-1, which has been linked to cancers. It has casein, which Dr. Campbell has said is, it is shown in his research to be connected to you know, promoting cancer. So there's a lot of reasons not to do dairy. Uh, and keep it and 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 it's th there are transition foods which aren't necessarily healthy uh, as the whole plant foods are uh, soy milk and almond milk I think if you go in the stores these days I think oat milk's oat milk is the latest rage there's probably more plant-based milks in the dairy department than there are uh, cow's milk I tell my clients to avoid the the oat milks and the plant milks that don't that have vitamin A palmitate for a couple of reasons. It takes the palm oil away from the animals like orangutans who need it, and also it doesn't help your heart. So I have them have certain brands which which I love like Eden Soy, West Soy, uh, Trader Joe's has a soy milk and a oat milk without added ingredients other than water. So this is wonderful um, to eat the best of the plant milks. Yeah, I think people have to understand that their uh, heart disease, their cholesterol levels are related to the amount of cholesterol they eat, which is in all animal products. There's no cholesterol in plant products, but also saturated fat. And you find saturated fat in, in butter, which is about 50% saturated fat, but the tropical oils, like coconut oil and palm oil, like you talked to, talked about, and there are lots of different names for these. Uh, they're about 90% saturated fat. And you not only find them in the dairy, but you find them in substantial quantities in vegan ice cream. Exactly. I find that the hardest thing for my clients to give up is the oil because it's, it's, it's uh, promoted as a health food especially in the Mediterranean diet. So I like what Dr. John McDougall said. It, they're healthy, healthier than we are because they eat less animals, but it's not because of the olive oil. It's despite the olive oil. But it still doesn't give us an okay to be putting all that high saturated fat in our body, right? Well, olive oil and uh, canola oil are actually low in saturated fat, but they are a processed food. And it has been shown that a tablespoon of olive oil will mess up your arterial reactivity with, for a couple of hours after you eat it. So it isn't a health food and it does actually raise your blood pressure uh, a little bit. And uh, so you're better off not using olive oil. I mean, there are tricks like water sauteing. And you know, if, if you look at many of our old recipes before we went on a whole plant diet, you know, the recipes always say throw two or three tablespoons of olive oil into the pan. Uh, or when you're making popcorn or something. It's just, it's almost like a reflex on every recipe and you really don't yeah. need it. I mean, if you really need, you can use sprays instead. You can get nonstick pans. A water sauteing is a technique. You just have to watch it a little closer and you have to be careful about the order you saute in. So you want to go with stuff like onions first and mushrooms that have more, more liquid in them. So those are just tricks. But once you've got the concept that olive oil is not a health food. Yeah then you have to learn how to move away from it. It is seriously the hardest thing I have my people give up. The other thing people don't like to give up is fish. They really, really, that's the last meat product that they give up. Yeah, and, and, and that's all tied into the omega-3 sort of exactly uh, stuff. Uh, I mean, there have been studies that show that eating fish does not help your heart. Uh, eating... Uh, Fish oil does not help your heart, and, and in fact, is a detriment to your heart. All that stuff, it contains mercury and arsenic. I remember the study they did a couple years ago where they sampled women's hair, mm -hmm. and the uh, 
amount of mercury and arsenic correlated with the amount of fish intake in the last two years. Wow. So, mm -hmm. I mean, the fish are swimming around in the ocean and we put everything into the rivers that flow into the ocean. So, and this gets all, all the way down from the uh, concentrated uh, persistent organic pollutants to metals like mercury and arsenic to microplastics, which they're now discovering and everything. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's just not a good way to eat. A lot of people don't seem to think fish is meat. And I don't know why, since it has, you know, it's a muscle and it's an animal muscle and it has high saturated fat and cholesterol. For some reason, they even put it in the vegetarian group for a while. They called it a plant. And it's so far from the truth. And the worst part is all the fish farms, which are filled with feces. And then they give those fish farms antibiotics and then they feed that to the cows. And the, and the chicken waste also then goes to the cows. And this is horrible for everyone. For the antibiotic use, I know they lease 21% of antibiotic into the feed and the water of chickens and other animals. And this makes antibiotic use pretty terrible for us too. What happens then to us when the animals are being fed all these antibiotics? What happens for humans at that point? Well, you know, of course, 80%, 90% of the antibiotics used in the country are used in animal agriculture. And the, uh, the industry writ large of animal agriculture, concentrated animal feed operations, seem to be linked, especially for birds and the bird flu, which is a pandemic that, uh, unlike this current one, which has a mortality rate that's going to be about 0.4%, the bird flu has a 50% mortality rate. And it broke out in Hong Kong in 1997. So it's out there in the world. And if, a 50, if, if something like that becomes a pandemic because of these concentrated animal feed operations in birds, especially in China, although we have them in this country too, and things that people can do other than eating well to, pr to protect their own health and laying aside some supplies at home just in case we have to be quarantined for long periods of time if something like H5N1 breaks out, they can support legislation at the national level, which would ban concentrated animal feed operations. Yes. Which would sort of eliminate things like the swine flu in 2009, which was, even though it started in Mexico, it was an American concentrated pork operation that was moved from Virginia to Mexico. Uh, but in, as far as the coronaviruses go, they don't seem to be coming out of the concentrated animal feed farm operations, they seem to be coming out of the live animal markets in Asia. And uh, 2002 was seemed to be the palm civet cat, seemed to be the intermediary. And then the, uh, the most recent one, it seems like the pangolin was the intermediary. Yeah. What people have to understand is these viruses have natural pools out in the real world. Uh, ducks harbor virus, influenza virus naturally. Bats are a big coronavirus reservoir. But it appears that the virus has to jump to an intermediary host before it comes to humans. And once it becomes a novel virus, something we haven't seen before, that's when we're in trouble. So what people can do is support bills like Senator Cory Booker introduced uh, yes. a Senate Corey Bill Booker. 3221, which is, uh, is the 2019 Farm System Reform Act, which was co-sponsored by Elizabeth Warren. Uh, she's the only co-sponsor so far. But people could, whatever state they're in, they could uh, call into their senator's office and request that they join uh, Senators Booker and uh, Warren as co-sponsors. There's also a Farm Systems Reform Act of 2020 that was introduced in the House of Representatives in May by Ro, Ro Rahana, who's a uh, representative from the 17th District in California. So nice. anybody can write their house representatives and ask to be co-sponsored. There are nine co-sponsors on that bill at this point. So we can't change what they do in China, but we could change things in this country, such as concentrated animal feed operations, live markets. Yes. There's legislation in California and in New York that are being written to phase out live markets in those states. So we might have to go state by state, but those seem to be the, animal agriculture sources for the pandemics we've seen so far. Well, except that I heard that like when the duck, ducks fly over the ponds and then that water is fed to the chickens and then that chicken feces is fed to the cows, 
we have this, uh, and then the pigs get involved in there with the bird flu. That's when we might have a really terrible pandemic with the factory farm issue. It hasn't, hasn't been stemmed from that yet, but I think that's the next place. I think Dr. John McDougall said when you're mixing and with animals in confined spaces when they're totally stressed out and their own immune system is way down, that's when you get into trouble with maybe a new virus forming. Well, these viruses see. are, you know, they're mutating. Both the influenza virus and the coronaviruses mutate quite a bit. Yeah. That's what they do naturally. And we've never been able to come up with a vaccine against the common cold, although we've tried. Uh, we have come up with an influenza vaccines, but they don't tend to be as effective because by the time they come out, a lot of these influenzas have mutated somewhat. Exactly. Uh, so uh, I... I I, see, I hear a lot of people hanging their hat on the vaccine that's coming for COVID. I'm not holding my breath. I mean, I hope it happens, but there's a long time frame for testing for live extenuated viruses. Uh, there are people trying to do RNA and DNA virus uh, vaccines uh, based on fragments of DNA and RNA, but they've never been approved. So uh, I, don't, I don't think a vaccine is going to be our way out. I think individuals have to eat well to maintain their health. Exactly. I think they have to have stores of food and personal protective equipment on hand at home. Because if something like the bird flu hits with a 50% mortality, nobody goes out. Healthcare workers don't go out. Workers yeah. don't go to food stores. There will not be any food for anybody. You will be contained in your house by force for up to 90 days. And they'll be rolling quarantine. So if we have to prepare for that as individuals, or we have to rely on the government to prepare and if their response to the current COVID-19 is any indication of what's going to happen the next time around, mm -hmm. I certainly wouldn't hold my breath and bet on the government. No, I think people are concentrating and hoping that the vaccine is the big cure-all. And I think it's our individual responsibility and our education to get out to people that we must stop factory farms. We must stop killing all animals for food, period. And then there's the whole wildlife trade market, which is huge. It's, I think it's like an $18 billion industry. Again, you're taking these animals out of their natural habitat, messing up the whole ecosystem again which also creates uh, more pandemic possibilities. So I think we need to stop concentrating, not stop concentrating, but not hoping the vaccine is, is the cure-all, like you say. We can focus on what we can do in this country, but we're not gonna control what they do in China. We can lead by example. Uh, I think if something like that were to get going, might have to take the, report, uh, the approach that they took in New Zealand, which they just closed their borders down. Yeah, exactly. They didn't let anybody in. So. Yeah. The trouble is if people are infectious before they're sick, they're often in your country before you know it. So unless oh, you're able no. to develop rapid testing to identify those people, which we weren't able to do in this country uh, mm -hmm. for a lot of reasons, uh, we, we really need to be able to improve our ability to close our borders and also to develop rapid testing uh, so we can identify individuals who are affected. Because each of these pandemics is a different is a different virus. It requires different testing and uh, has to be developed from scratch. Uh, the South Koreans were able to do this very effectively. Uh, so they didn't have to close their businesses down. They were able to just uh, test and quarantine and, uh, in place. So other countries have done this much better than we have. Hong Kong's yes. another example. Taiwan's yep. another example. Uh, we have too much politics in ours, yeah. Well, we're just not prepared. I mean. The importance of being prepared and uh, applying act the best science quickly enough and then being able to scale up for, for vaccines or testing is critical. Exactly. <clears throat> um, I'm also appalled at what we do in our factory farms. We take the blood of the slit cow, drain it, and give it to the baby calves who are supposed to get the milk from their mother. We take the milk for our cheese and our yogurt and whatever, and the baby cow is fed cow blood instead, which is a, a recipe for mad cow disease, correct? I mean, it's just absolutely horrible. They do this to fatten them up. And on top of that, they give the antibiotics, you know, they don't give antibiotics for, for keeping things well. You know what the number one reason is? To fatten them up. It actually makes them heavier so they can get more money at sale point. 
And that is something I learned in the pandemic book that Michael Greger wrote, How to Survive a Pandemic. And I was just shocked about that. I thought the antibiotics were used to make them disease free because we're combining them in these horrible conditions, but it isn't, it's to fatten them up. And so we've got to stop all this factory farming and we have to stop abusing animals and let them be free. We don't need to eat them, we have no reason to put them in our mouth, correct? I mean, there's no reason we don't have to have one piece of animal product, not eggs, not dairy, not fish, nothing. And we will survive. And better than that, Dr. Forrester, we get healthier. I got rid of my own heart disease, my own cancer, and my own prediabetes, and my obesity. Yeah, all by changing to a whole food diet. Once you got the cash and cheese out. Huh? Oh yeah, the cashew cheese sauce. I was addicted on that for a while. I agree. I, I uh, did gain a little weight eating the cashew cheese sauce because I do love it. But well, the uh, you I keep it in moderation now. You mentioned mad cow disease, which uh, is a type of disease that is very rare in humans. It's caused by a prion, which is a certain type of protein, and it first came out in uh, England. Uh, killed a 15-year-old girl, which is highly unusual, and it was traced to cattle, and there was a big, they killed off a lot of cattle, but in this country, they're no longer allowed to feed the brains and the spinal columns, which seems to be how the prions are transmitted. You see it pop up periodically, so... Uh, but the blood from the brain? No, the blood's never been down? connected, it's never been connected to prion transmi transmission. But I mean... This is new. I'm not, I'm not condoning the practice. I'm just saying it's a simple mm -hmm. nervous system mediated transfer of the prion, which causes a dementia like pumps right. holes in people's brains. It's a particularly brutal way to go. And it's been traced to uh, other diseases. Sheep have scrappy, and there mm -hmm. are other sort of uh, prion like diseases. But until the 1980s, we didn't even know prions existed, mm, yeah. uh, we hadn't even discovered them. So mm -hmm. the need, I think the take home message from these pandemics is we need to be prepared both on the individual and government levels. Mm -hmm. And we also need to uh, apply the best science. And the best science around eating is eating whole plant foods, eliminating uh, dairy and animal products and concentrated foods that are processed. Do you have a suggestion for people on how, the best way for them to transition to a whole plant diet? Well, it's very, you know, it's an interesting question because I think it's different for different people. And of course, mm -hmm. it depends on their goals and it depends a lot on their home environment. Mm -hmm. if, if they're cooking for themselves alone or cooking for others or they have kids at home and mm -hmm. there are some nice resources out there. I mean, and you as a coach probably know you can start with breakfast, go to lunch, go to dinner. But most people are, are serving themselves, you know, one or two things for breakfast, three or four things for lunch, six to 10 things for dinner not the occasional stuff that gets you in trouble, it's the regular stuff. So if you can look at your own menus that work for your family and just make them healthier, mm -hmm. you know, you can still have spaghetti, mm -hmm. marinara sauce and vegetables instead of spaghetti and meatballs. Exactly. There, are, there are transition foods, you know, the faux meats and, you know, when you go out to eat, there's the uh, Beyond Meat and the Impossible Burgers are now making them into, themselves into restaurants. Mm -hmm. So you can go out and have a burger. That's not a health food. It's still mm -hmm. a manufactured product, but it is, it is much better for you than the animal product. Exactly. And there's so many good resources out there. We have forks, well, watching the films, Forks Over Knives, the Game Changers, but having the Forks Over Knives website there with meal plans for you, just take about 10 recipes and mix and match those for breakfast, lunch, and dinner right from their website. And then you start getting the feeling of how to cook without oil. You learn how to cook without harmful foods and foods that actually help you get healthier. And then there's nutritionfacts.org with Dr. Michael Greger. There's the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, PCRM.org. They have a 21-day kickstart program on there to get you started. And of course, if you email me at veganmentor at gmail.com, I can help coach you. And I also teach the food for life classes, which are diabetes and cancer classes, but they also weight loss. So I can help. And Dr. Don, I always 
get a hold of Dr. Dom when I have questions I can't answer. And so I just love having you as a resource. It's fab fabulous. Thank you. Well, I like being in my retired state. I like to provide uh, presentations and information to individuals that come across who are on chronic conditions because unfortunately most of the physicians haven't had the um, satisfaction of getting people off medications and watching people lose weight. They're often providing misinformation of uh, the latest diets. I mean, you know, I worked for Permanente for 30 years and I think the diets that were coming out when I started were coming back again. They were just repackaged. I don't think I saw the grapefruit diet, but it's just about everything else. Oh yeah. And, uh, the Atkins you know, diet, South Beach diet. People want to lose weight. It's uh, calorie density is the central concept. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael Greger wrote a tome uh, called "How Not to Diet," which came out, you know, within Great. the last. Yeah, and it's 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 a lot of details, of, and there are 400 pages of references, which fortunately are on the website, not in the book. So the book's only 500 pages. Mm -hmm. But if people are really interested in taking the first step toward weight loss. I, I think Jeff Novick, the registered dietitian, whose presentation, yes. Calorie Density, Eat More, Way Less, and Live Longer, which is freely available on YouTube to watch. He's funny, and it's the central organizing concept around uh, food, because we do eat, you know, humans eat three to five pounds of food a day. That's what they do. It varies. Mm -hmm. You eat a certain amount. Jim eats a certain amount. I eat a certain amount. My wife eats a certain amount. We're, we're pretty consistent with ourselves, but it varies from individual to individual. So you just have to put the right fuel in your body and your engine will do well and you won't come down with chronic diseases. Uh, Chef AJ has the ultimate weight loss program. She's helped thousands of people get well and get their weight, their body weight correct. And that's wonderful to watch them too. I have one lady who lost her diabetes for 27, after 27 years, mm -hmm. she was a good she went to the doctor, she got her metformin, she was going up and down and up and down. She took my whole food plant, whole food plant class and from Food for Life, and now it's been five years, she is diabetic free for the first time in 27 years. Well, people people so, think diabetes has something to do with carbohydrates, but Walter yeah. Kempner, Walter Kempner was curing people with diabetes in the 1940s at Duke University with white rice. So yeah. It's, it's, it's the fat, the diet and the fat on the body, which gets you back to the olive oil. And, and most of the fats in the, in the, uh, are, are not plant fats. I mean, avocados are high in fats. Some of seeds and nuts are a little high in fats, but those fats don't seem to affect people as much as the other fats do. No. And so, you know, when we work with people down the McDougal program, it's like get the fat off your body and the fat out of your diet. Of course, it, down there, where you're living for eight days and they're giving you buffet breakfast, lunch, and dinners, they don't cook with fat. All the fat food is low fat. It's easy to get the fat out of your diet, but to get the fat off your body, it's a slower process. You know, you're talking half a pound, three quarters of a pound a week because each pound of fat is 3,500 stored calories. So uh, you can have some initial success. It looks like you're losing weight quickly. Often that's salt related yeah. or, you know, it's not long term, is it? No, nope, not long term. Calorie restriction uh, has not been shown to be effective. Long -term. I would like to know how you, as a doctor, when you first started out, you weren't teaching a whole, whole plant diet, I'm sure. Uh, and how did you get to the realization that you should be teaching your patients? Well, I'd always had an interest plants. in prevention, of course, and I did get some nutrition in medical school back in the Middle Ages. But we've actually learned stuff since then. And it wasn't until Esselstyn and uh, Ornish did their work in the 90s with heart disease that it started to become apparent that diet was a big factor. And we've learned How a lot. How you got it, though, and not the other doctors? I don't get that. Well, because a friend asked, asked my wife and I to read the China study. We read the China study by Colin Campbell, and then we went on plants at that point. But even the two of us eating plants uh, have... Over over the last 14 years, it'll be 14 years in September. Uh, we we are making changes. You know, we're eliminating oil. We're eliminating some of the processed foods. We're you know going more with uh, more vegetables, a little mm -hmm. bit more raw. I mean, it, it's it's a personal journey. Uh, mm -hmm. So then, uh, about three months after we read Con Campbell's book, uh, Neil Barnard came to town with his book, Reversing Type 2 Diabetes. I love that book. Oh. Yeah, no, it's, it's still one of the best books out there, I think. It just really explains it. It has recipes. 
That's what uh, saved my client. Yep. Clients. And, uh, you know, Neil came to town and he signed a book for me. I got, I started using it with my patients and then the patients started getting better. And that's when I got started to ask you classes on it. So I started giving talks on it. So that's what I, I got to hear some of your talks at Kaiser too. Yep. Yep. That was really it's, nice. It's a little bit, uh, the doctors, you know, are, are not trained to do this. Uh, people aren't, for instance, the next cardiology hire in Northern California with the Permanent Team Medical Group, I'm reasonably sure will be somebody who's much more proficient in interventions or electrophysiology and doesn't use lifestyle, particularly nutrition, mm -hmm. as the first step. They're always pushing pills and procedures. But Kaiser is ahead of the game, don't you think, as far as other hospitals, at least in our area in Sacramento? I, I will agree with you. Kaiser way ahead of everybody else. Well, they, they've got a good PR department. Mm -hmm. uh, when they start decreasing the percentage of their patients that are diabetic, I will give them credit for that. They're not doing that. And they're also, the average in the country is people over the age of 65 on five or more medicine. Northern California patients are on six or more medicines over age 65. So we're doing a better job of convenience for patients. You know, you can get your lab tests and your x-rays and, and your prescriptions are delivered to your door. Whether you should be taking them or not is another discussion. I do think, given being in Sacramento, looking at Sutter, Dignity, and Permanente, I would give the nod to Permanente at this point. But I don't think any of the medical industries in this area uh, are doing what they should be as far in this area. I mean, there are various movements, small mm -hmm. numbers of doctors who are becoming involved, mm -hmm. but they've got a long way to go. Yeah. And, and like I said, I'm, I'm a, I was trained as an engineer, so I believe in results. Yeah. So when the number of type 2 diabetics go down in their population, then I'll start giving them credit. Uh, one time I went to visit a friend in the hospital with heart surgery and on her plate was um, hamburger meat and cheese. Which hospital? That was a Sutter. Yeah. Yeah, well, and I know, was going, what? I mean, a <laughs> permanent you give a heart patient? Permanente is still teaching uh, counting carbohydrates in their diabetic classes and they're still, you know, so, you know, they're, 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 what they're, they're saying, what about carbohydrates? They're counting carbohydrates. They're teaching them. No. So, I mean, really? yeah. Oh, so, you know. That's disappointing. Yeah. Dr. Hey, Morris, Kelly. Yeah. Hey, Kelsey. Yes. We, I'm going to open up the floor. We've got about 17 minutes left. Thank you both so much for all of the information you've provided. It's been mm -hmm. um, incredibly helpful. We have three questions so far. Can we go ahead and jump into those? Sure. Certainly. Wonderful. So the first one um, is the person states, I recall reading from Dr. Greger, I think, um, that pre probiotics were a waste of money. Do you have an opinion on that issue? There are very specific uh, medical conditions where probiotics that are prescribed that you get by prescription can be useful. It's much better if you change your whole diet from the standard American diet to a whole plant diet, then you're, you're feeding and getting an entirely different type of bacteria in your colon. So uh, without, you know, and I've been out of mainline practice now for about 12 years, so I'm sure they've learned a little bit more about probiotics, but uh, I think the first step is to eat right. Uh, and I wouldn't worry about, you know, cause a lot of people are pushing yogurts for their, you know, getting the biotics in, you know, you, you've got almost a thousand different species of bacteria in your colon. And the idea of putting one or two species in your mouth and having it go through your acid in your stomach and then finally filter its way down to your colon and thinking that's gonna have something to do with it is probably a little bit of fictitious thinking. Sure. I find that having your gut microbiome fixed by eating the whole plant diet is really helpful, then you don't need those probiotics, I'm finding at least with some of my clients. Um, our next question is, some viewers have trouble keeping weight on. How is the best way to eat a healthy diet and still keep weight on? Well, it depends on the type of weight you're trying to keep on. Most of the people, uh, you can eat a little bit more calorie dense plant foods like avocados and yeah. nuts. But you also got to remember 
that being lean is probably healthier than being over fat. So, you know, it was like my mother-in-law went to the doctor once and she, he told her, he scared her and told her she had to lose weight and she started losing weight and all her fat friends were telling her she's looking sick. So, you know, I mean, we get to the point now where being obese is sort of normal. I mean, more people are obese in this country uh, than, than are not obese. Uh, in some places like Mississippi, it's particularly bad. Uh, but so keeping the proper weight on, if you want to gain weight, you can lift, do some light weight training or something like that to, to get more muscle mass. One of the problems as we get older is we get less active and we actually, we can be thin, but we can be over fat. We call that sarcopenic obesity, but nobody liked that term. So they now call it normal weight obesity. These are people who have a high percent body fat. By keeping your uh, balance and stability and muscle strength up, you'll have less falls. Uh, so that's my suggestion is eating higher calorie dense foods like nuts and uh, avocados and things like that. I would not fall into the trap of eating oils and things like that. No, I have people who are underweight have more uh, calorie dense smoothies because you can eat a lot of food that way. And the people who are trying to lose weight, I take them off all smoothies or juices. So I find that helps people maintain their weight that they want, at least when I work with people. Yeah, that's good advice. Um, can we talk more about good and bad oils? Are there any oils that are okay to eat or cook with? that are friendly to animals and the environment. There may be some oils that are better than other oils, but I don't think oil's a health food, mm -mm. Nor, nor do I think it's a necessary part of the diet. Uh, you can learn to cook without olive oil. You can learn to cook without canola oil. Canola oil has a little less saturated fat in it, uh, and both canola oil and olive oil are basically non-animal derived uh, products. So you know, they're free of animal products, but that doesn't make them a health product. Uh, uh, so that's why I have trouble getting people off of oils because my animal rights friends and my people who care about animals, they say, Linda, it's vegan. I said, I know it's vegan, but it's not going to help you. And I need you to be healthy to help me help the animals. So I say, please take out the oil. And I show them how to do that. But it's, I find it hurts the endothelial cells too in your arteries and it doesn't help with diabetes either. It's also, uh, it's interesting, the leading source of calories for women in the country since 1980 is salad oils. Oh. Mm -hmm. They make these big salads and they put, you know, oils, salad oils on there that are very calorie dense. So, uh, you know. Dr. Forster, can you, can I ask you a question? Um, I think that, if we add vinegar to our greens, that helps with some sort of omega absorption. I haven't seen that in the literature. It wouldn't surprise me. All I know is balsamic vinegar or vinegar on top of salads is a lot less calorie dense and probably healthier for you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it is. Yeah. For whatever reason. I know there are, like for myself, um, I try and replace oil when I'm sauteing vegetables with water. So that would be one way that someone could. Right, and you can use broth too or water, you know. Uh, it just, it requires, you can't just put it on the stove and ignore it. You've got to have to pay a little bit more attention to it, you know, or you're going to like likely get things sticking to the bottom of the pan or burning or something like that. But you've probably found that out yourself, Kelsey. Yes, I have. <laughs> um, our next question is, I've heard too much soy can have a negative effect on your body. Is this true? I've never seen a study on too much soy. Uh, soy does have phytoestrogens in it, and it's often confused. Women who have breast cancer have less recurrences if they drink, eat soy. If you, if you give adolescent girls two servings of soy a day, they have 25% less breast cancer risk. Mm -hmm. uh, soy tends to be good. The only study that showed ill effects of soy was a study that showed it affected dementia adversely. And when they went and looked at the study, they found that the soy had been preserved in formaldehyde, which is oh. a neurotoxin. So uh, oh, no. th there was other parts of that study that brought it under scrutiny that didn't make sense. But soy is actually a good thing. It doesn't give men estrogen or it doesn't 
stimulate estrogen in women. It's a different type of estrogen. And Dr. Greger has some very interesting videos yeah. on phytoestrogens. And if the nice thing about nutritionfacts.org, you can go up to the source, up to the video and just browse the library. And if you have a question about any food, any spice, anything, there's probably a video on it. The, the only downside to the website is there can be so many, it's hard to figure out which ones to go to. I mean, if you look under dairy, there might be a hundred of them or something like that. But uh, I know that, um, I think it was Dr. Bernard's book, he explains how the phyto or the plant estrogen from soy actually can block the harmful estrogens that are trying to enter your body, therefore helping you against cancer, which is really nice. It's actually a blocker. The only reason I don't have my clients eat too much soy is only reason at all because I, and if they have cancer, I continue the soy, but the only reason is because it is one of the higher fat beans. And so I can get fat myself if I eat soy every single day, I can actually gain weight. It's like cashew cheese again, you know? So I watch my soy intake for that reason. But if I had any cancer at all, I would eat more because I want to block the, the well, harmful estrogens from coming in my body. The soy, of course, is, is usually processed. Most people aren't eating a lot of edamame beans, which is where the soy comes from. Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, most of the soy raised in our country and other countries is raised to feed animals and not humans. So we're missing an opportunity there. But tempeh and tofu and stuff like that are processed, but they've been used for years and they're perfectly except for some isolated cases like weight or something like that where you might want to pay attention to it uh, regular consumption of soy is probably very healthy Kelsey okay wonderful um, are there any websites or books with vegan recipes um, that you would recommend that would help improve our diets Boy, I, I love the forks over knives recipes um, they have meal plans and whole recipes for you to try. And it's at your fingertips. You just have to look on the computer. So I really like that as a, uh, when I'm talking to people for the first time, I say, look, you don't have time to get your book yet, but you can go to Forks Over Knives and get wonderful healthy recipes that are made with no oil, no added oils, and, and go ahead and get started that way. And then I like, of course, I have a whole slew of books I give out and movies you know, the movies like Game Changers, The Game Changers, What the Health, Forks Over Knives movie, Cowspiracy, and there's some other ones too. I think as far as a cookbook question, Kelsey, we have our cookbooks, I think, in our house have cookbooks. I have so many of them. But what my wife does often is she looks around what she's got and then she just Googles that and gets recipes that she needs that fits the food she has in the refrigerator. But it's a pretty, it's a pretty individual, uh, it depends on where individuals are. That's why individual coaching is important sometimes because people would value different, you know, we've been in this movement for a long time and uh, I'm familiar with the people at uh, True North Health Center and that's sort of at the other end of the spectrum, which is whole plant foods without soil, oil, or sugar, SOS we call it, which is at the end of the spectrum. And I don't think anybody on a standard American diet would be ready with that sort of cookbook, but something in the middle. There are lots of transition foods. Uh, Miyoki Shinner is giving some uh, incredible butters and cheeses out there, which are plant-based, which can are healthier probably than butter, but aren't really a good health food, but they can help people in their transition because as Linda can tell you, giving up dairy can be kind of tough. Uh, I think that the the Dr. John McDougall's website also has a lot of recipes and books and things you can order. So I find that very helpful because you learn that carbohydrates are our friend. The more carbs I eat, the more I lose weight, which is what I'm always trying to do because I'm always in danger of becoming overweight at any given time. But I think Dr. John McDougall with Mary McDougall's recipes is a very good site there's so many people, if you email me, I'll give you the whole list of all the healthier foods, Kathy Freston and Katie May, and just tons of people who, who make the healthy recipes to get you started. Because I know I get healthy, 
I get unhealthy vegan clients all the time. They can't lose the weight. They don't feel great. And I help them transition to the healthy vegan diet, which means no oil, no processed foods. If you're not ready for that, like Dr. Don Forster said, you can go ahead and get the transition cooking and foods. But I like to have people jump right in to the healthy side because why? Because they feel so good. They take off the extra pounds they don't like if they need to, or they get their heart disease reversed more quickly, or they get rid of their diabetes. And this is a wonderful thing. When you watch people transition into these healthy lifestyles, it is the biggest reward ever. Biggest reward ever. I yeah. think one place to start, Kelsey, for people too, is the regular foods they're used to eating, You know, looking at recipes they have that they can modify to make them healthy. All the spices, are perfectly acceptable. I can't think of any spice, Linda might be able to come up with one, but they're all based on plants and they're all uh, very low calorie density. So, you know, if you can spice foods up, use the spices, you know, to suit your taste. Some people like blander foods, some people like spicier foods. Uh, Jeff Novick, uh, who's a good friend and colleague, uh, he, he puts on some fast, he has fast food series and he basically makes all his meals within 11 minutes. And he batch cooks, so he triples the recipe and he eats one, puts one in the refrigerator, one in the freezer. He does that for three days. Then he's got three meals in the refrigerator and three meals in the freezer. So he doesn't have to cook for a couple of days. For those people of limited time, it uh, uses mixtures of spices, just takes some shortcuts. And he does it with simple materials too. I also find it helpful if you do your batch shopping and batch cooking at the, all on the same day. So you go get your groceries, you bring them home, you chop them, and the things you're not going to cook right now, you can keep in those mason jars uh, chopped up, ready to go. So when you watch your meal that evening, you just throw it in the pan, cook it up in a little water, and it's delicious. Add your seasoning. But make it simple. Get all that done at once. And then the rest of the week, you can relax more. It's really helpful. That is that is definitely helpful. And a lot of these links, so our viewers know, have been included in the chat oh, good. Uh, section, so you can find them there. Uh, we have a couple of more, couple more minutes, and a few more questions. Um, is there any connection between lung disease, not cancer, and diet or nutrition? There is one study that shows that people that go on a plant diet, they're chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which is what people are most concerned with who are smokers, um, that it has gotten better over time. Uh, there clearly is a connection between reactive airway disease like asthma and uh, how you eat, and particularly dairy. So if, if you've got any sort of problem like asthma or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, you can go to nutritionfacts.org look those conditions up, click on the link. It'll give you a video. Not only does it give you the video, but it'll, it can give you all the articles that he talks about. I think that's good for viruses too, because this COVID-19 is in the respiratory tract, right, Don? Dr. Don, Dr. Forster? Well, the, the coronaviruses, the common cold viruses, has been giving us head colds for years and years and years. What's new about this COVID-19 is it's modified so that it can actually get into the receptors of our lungs. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it hits the nose and then it goes down to the lungs where it creates a lot of the problems. So uh, that, that was its sort of novel mutation that allowed this pandemic to start courtesy of uh, the live markets in Wuhan, China, which fortunately the Chinese closed Wuhan down on January 23rd, which was actually the day before Chinese New Year's. Uh, four, 400 million Chinese were supposed to be coming through Wuhan because it's a central transportation hub. So mm -hmm. if they hadn't closed the city down on the 23rd, it would have been all over China. The gosh knows how far in the world it would have spread how fast. Somebody told me they have it back open now. I'm not sure if that's correct. Yeah, Wuhan's back open. Oh. But, but anytime you... You know, these pandemics go through the populations and they go away. Uh, and if you flatten the curve, you have to understand that what you're doing 
is deferring some of the infections later. It doesn't mean you're going to have less infections necessarily. Mm -hmm. It just mm -hmm. means you're going to be able to deal. The healthcare industry is not going to get hit with a big spike all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. So uh, they are opening up different countries, depending on their success of their methods. You know, like I said, South Korea never closed its businesses down because they had adequate testing. Um, so we're at 12 o'clock now. Um, I would like to wrap it up with asking uh, both of you, if you could offer one piece of advice to viewers, what would it be? For me, it would be more whole plant foods uh, with minimal salt, oil, sugar, and processing and support any legislation in the country which is trying to remove live markets in the U.S. or concentrated animal feed operations. And mine would be the same, exactly the same, except I would also add that I think humanity has to stop abusing and using animals in factory farms or even free range farms, were, which are not much better if you find out about them. No animal wants to die. And I think we need to stop abusing them because it's like it's karma. They, we're abusing them. And then these pandemics and other viruses are coming after us. They're giving us heart disease, cancer, asthma, diabetes, you name it, because of what we're doing to them and then we eat them. So I'd like to have people just stop and find out how, and I can help you with that, uh, transition off the animal products altogether. And I'm hoping that you will reach out and find out how to do that. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you um, both Dr. Forrester and Linda Middlesworth. We appreciate you being here so much. Um, and then thank you for our viewers for joining us today. And for those of you who made donations to Animal Place, we appreciate it so much. Um, are there any, is there anything else you two would like to say before we sign off? If, if people have attended and haven't gotten their questions answered, you can, they can send them to you, Kelsey, forward them to me. I'll be glad to ask or answer them. Same here, Kelsey. And also, uh, please donate to Animal Place because they save these animals that would be in dire straits and half dead if they didn't take care of them. And it's the most wonderful place you have to take. Well, after the COVID, you need to take your children there to meet the animals because once you know the animals, you don't want to hurt them. And we need to teach our children that animals are precious beings who don't want to die any more than we do. And so I said, please, I beg you to, to donate to Animal Place to help take care of all these wonderful animals. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you both. Thank you to our viewers. And hopefully we'll see you again. Okay. Bye-bye. Well. Bye. -bye. Bye.